For some perspective on the state of race relations in America, we brought a very special panel together today. DeRay McKesson is an activist with Black Lives Matter. He works with former Obama administration communicators at Crooked Media, and he's the author of On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope, which comes out next month. Christian Picciolini is a former white supremacist whose organization, The Free Radicals Project, now seeks to pull other people out of the life that he left behind. He's also the author of the book, White American Youth. John Meacham is a historian and author. His latest book is The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. And Jamel Bowie is the chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine, who has studied and written extensively about the history of slavery in America. He's also a political analyst here at CBS News and perhaps most importantly, dad to a 10-year-old baby <laughs> boy named Carter. So congratulations to you, 10-day-old. Uh, I should say. Um, I, I want to start with you, Jamel. I should also mention you're a Charlottesville resident. You heard a lot of frustration from the mayor. Yeah. When we look nationally, the latest CBS poll shows that racial tensions in the past year have increased. And the percentage of Americans saying that, 61%. The majority of this country thinks it's getting worse. Right. Why hasn't there been national he healing? I think... I think the principal reason why there hasn't been national healing is simply that the president seems to see a political advantage in sort of intensifying uh, racial strife and racial conflict. I think the you the, put this solely on him. I, I think I think I don't know how I'd completely distribute the blame, but I think it really does matter that the president, far from trying to find avenues for racial understanding or healing, tends in, instead uh, goes after uh, black football players, instead makes a show of, of getting into um, spats and fights with black celebrities, um, instead still has not been able to bring himself to fully condemn white supremacists. Even the statement yesterday, um, we condemn racism against all sides. It's sort of nonsensical. What happened in Charlottesville last year wasn't racism against all sides. It was white supremacists going after uh, black communities, going after other communities of color. So I don't know, you know, it's impossible to kind of break out some numerical distribution again for how much blame goes to whom. But I think if the president is supposed to be this national voice of unity, it really does matter that the president um, has explicitly rejected that calling instead um, fanning the flames of, I think, racial strife. John, you've written uh, this book, The Soul of America. You were inspired in many ways by what happened in Charlottesville. And you've said that this is a moment almost like what we saw in the hours after the Civil War. Absolutely. I think this moment's not new. I think it's the most vivid manifestation in memory of some of the worst instincts in the American character. So it's not a Trump effect per se. No, he's exacerbated it. And he's both marshaled fear and manufactured it. I think the reason he's at the pinnacle of power, uh, for many reasons. 19, you know, we have a white supremacist march or rally in Washington today. In 1925, there were 50,000 Klansmen coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. H.L. Mencken covered it. Uh, 1926, same thing happened. There were three to five million members of the Klan in, in, in the 20s. The institutions of the Republic worked in order to fight that. What just because it's happened before, though, doesn't mean we relax. What, what it does mean, I think, is that we look at these moments where the perennial American problem around the issues of race, which has been going on for about 400 years, from when we were British North America to when we were under the Articles of Confederation to, and you've got to love a Sunday when you can mention the Articles of Confederation, <laughs> just as a basic rule, to the Constitution, all the way through the Civil War and forward. It's, it is the, the perennial issue in the life of the nation. And so while we shouldn't think that tomorrow can be absolutely, is all going to disappear, tomorrow can be better. There is a lesson within the last 50 years that with the civil rights legislation in the 1960s, things got better. So to surrender to the fear as opposed to embracing the hope, to go to, to your point, is, is, a, is a real uh, setback in, the, in terms of presidential leadership. Dore, you've in some ways made a career out of trying to make better tomorrows, to borrow John's phrase there, uh, as a protester. But you began doing this as an activist well before there was a President Trump. Um, why do you think Black Lives Matter needs to be out there on the streets today counter-protesting instead of ignoring Unite the Right? 
Yeah, I think it's important that we always stand up and tell the truth. I've always thought about protests as the idea of telling the truth in public, and that's important. There will be many people out. When you ask the question, too, about sort of what healing looks like, it's like I'm mindful that truth comes before the reconciliation, right? And what we find in this moment is people unwilling to tell the truth about where we are. So what does it mean that we're in a country where a third of all the people killed by a stranger is actually killed by a police officer? Or one in 11 homicides in California is committed by an officer. We talk about some of the disparities. It's like in New York City, 90% of the people arrested for marijuana are black and brown. You don't believe that 90% of the people who use marijuana in New York City are black or brown. And we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined. Like those things are about race. And until we are actually able to walk into that and say like this is actually happening and that we should do something structurally to change it, I think there will always be here. Is that Trump sort of sticks us in this moment where it's a lot of emotion and a lot of rhetoric, but no real substance. Even the prison bill that he's putting forth could all be done administratively. Like that actually doesn't need Congress to do it, but like he traps us in this conversation that isn't moving us anywhere. So I'm interested in how do we continue to tell the truth, whether it's on the street or whether it's in spaces like this or boardrooms, that actually sets us up to change structures. You're talking about the prison reform and possibly sentencing reform that could address mandatory minimums. Yeah, yeah. so the sentencing reform has not been a part of this, any iteration of the bill that we've seen so far, the first act step, the first act bill, uh, or first step. But all the things that they're proposing, like not shackling pregnant women, they could do that now. Sessions is against those things. But again, like this is about saying this is what's happening in this country and like we can actually do something structural to address it. And people talk about truth and reconciliation without acknowledging that the truth comes first. I want to ask you here because um, there's a criticism about having conversations like this, which is that somehow we are stoking racial division by talking about it rather than healing. You, you have made the point you need to talk about things. You were recruited into a white supremacist movement when you were 14, is that right? That's correct, yeah, 1987. Is talking about this how it works? You know, I think we have to talk about it because there are two things that extremists love. They love silence and they love violence. If we're silent, they grow because they're unfettered. They can convince people. Uh, if we're violent, we play right into their hands because they come to places like Washington, D.C. or Charlottesville or even Skokie, Illinois in the 1970s because they're progressive communities and their whole job is to provoke and to intimidate. So, you know, I think we cannot be silent about it, but we also can't adopt their tactics and be violent. So for these counter protesters today, your advice would be be keep visible, your be vocal, be vigilant, but don't be violent. Do you agree with some of the journalism around what you've seen with the Unite the Right rally that actually things have gotten harder in the past year, that they're more splintered, that there has been a negative impact on that movement? I, I, I've seen it myself. Uh, several of the leaders and the organizers from last year have uh, publicly stated not to go to the rally, uh, but I think that it's a PR move for them. I think that they're, tr they're trying to mainstream even further because they know that their image from last year didn't sit well even with you know, American white racists in some cases. So now they're even going further into the mainstream and they're starting to drop even some of that oppressive language. And I think on that point, there, there's good evidence that some of this mainstream movement has been successful. The uh, Senate candidate in Virginia, Corey Stewart, mm -hmm. essentially openly allies himself with these uh, with these figures, has uh, taken, it's been seen in photos with known white supremacists, has white nationalists on his campaign staff, people who have worked with them. Um, and that's that's serious. He's a United States Senate candidate. Um, uh, who was endorsed by the president of the United States. Exactly. Um, that 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 for me is evidence that even if there was a major setback in Charlottesville last year, that the the larger conflict here is far from settled, and that white supremacists and white nationalists, or however whoever you want to call them, however you want to call them, are making their way into mainstream politics and and uh, pushing arguments that are making their, that are finding their their place in mainstream. And don't forget that David Duke was a Louisiana right. House right. of Representatives for three years. Right. And said last year that this is, we got to take our country back. This is why we elected Donald Trump. He said right. that in Charlottesville. And this is, this is a political strategy that's been unfolding since January 1866, when a guy named Edward Alfred Pollard, a Richmond journalist, wrote a book called The Lost Cause, where he argued that the war was over, but the battle for ideas, the argument against what was called consolidated government then, the big government, the fight against Washington, that this would be the war by other means. 
and it was the entire ar intellectual uh, and cultural architecture of the resistance to the implications of the verdict of the Civil War. And it's been unfolding not simply in the South, but with the complicity of the North for 150 years. I want to talk more about this on the other side of the commercial break, so stay with us. And we hope all of you will be back with us in a moment.